Community Health is proud to have served friends and neighbors for more than 90 years. Henry County has more than iconic basketball sites. Visitors can enjoy enriching, entertaining, and recreational experiences in Henry County. Learn more at henrycountyin.org. Henry County REMC is a not-for-profit, member consumer-owned electric cooperative serving Henry County and parts of the surrounding counties. Our mission is to provide safe, reliable, and cost-competitive electrical service to enhance the lives of our member consumers and the communities we serve. Newcastle is a vibrant, progressive community with a quality of life where families can thrive and businesses can build and grow. And it is the center for culture and commerce in the region. Newcastle is home to leading manufacturers, the Indiana Basketball Hall of Fame, and Robert Indiana's Love Sculpture. Reach Networks provides businesses with information technology, from voice over phone service, managed IT and remote computer backup, to enterprise software and hardware. Its retail location is at Computer & Company in Newcastle. More information is at reach-networks.com. Now Entering is made possible with support from Henry County Community Foundation. Reach Networks, with additional support from Citizen State Bank, City of Newcastle, Henry Community Health, Henry County Destination Development, Henry County REMC, Doug Meyer State Farm, ERA Integrity Real Estate, Hensey Brown Funeral Service, Indiana Basketball Hall of Fame, Jack's Donuts, McGowan Insurance, Newcastle Henry County Chamber of Commerce. Hi, I'm Mayor Greg York. You are now entering Newcastle, Indiana. About 17,000 people make their home in Newcastle, a city in Henry County along the banks of the Big Blue River. Ashel Woodward planted the first corn crop here a few years before the town's 1822 establishment. And Newcastle became known as the Rose City in the early 1900s as dozens of greenhouses here grew the famous American Beauty Roads. John D. Maxwell brought the largest automobile factory in the world to Newcastle in 1907. And world famous Hoosier Kitchen Cabinets were made here for almost half a century. However, Hoosiers far and wide recognize the name Newcastle for an entirely different reason today. This town is crazy about basketball and it has been for over a hundred years. Basketball fans from around the world come here to visit two landmarks, the world's largest and finest high school field house and the Indiana Basketball Hall of Fame. But residents of Newcastle know this city has a lot more to offer than basketball, including the local art scene, great trails and parks, and most importantly, countless people and organizations working to make Newcastle a great place to live. You'll see that in these stories, told by the residents themselves, through their own photos and videos. You're now entering Newcastle, Indiana. So the Indiana Basketball Hall of Fame was actually created in the 1960s and existed in Indianapolis. And in the 1980s, they decided that they wanted a full-fledged museum experience to showcase Indiana's great basketball 
history. 13 different towns and cities across Indiana actually wanted to become the home of the Indiana Basketball Hall of Fame. Eventually, Newcastle won out. Uh, construction started in 1988, and our museum, where it stands now on Trojan Lane, opened to the public in 1990. So in almost 31 years, we've had well over 300,000 visitors in total. They've come from all 92 Indiana counties. They've come from all 50 United States and from 64 different foreign countries. We portray the history of the sport from its earliest origins in our state in the 1890s until the current season. And so we, we document and preserve that history. Uh, we certainly recognize and honor and induct the greatest players, the greatest coaches, uh, broadcasters, other folks associated with the sport. Uh, you get a lot of folks who are Larry Bird fans. Uh, they know Coach Wood and his UCLA success. And then also Oscar Robertson, by many of a certain age, are, are, uh, consider him the greatest player of all time. And then the Milan 1954 state championship team. Whether folks know about the team or they just love the movie Hoosiers, it's subject to conversation and that's something they, they can't get enough of. We have one of the rings that was awarded to the 1954 Milan Indians state championship team. Cale Hudson was the principal at Milan High School in 1954. He actually was originally from Newcastle. He donated the ring to our facility. Of all the things we have, that ring stands out to me as being iconic, I guess is the word that comes to my mind. One of our docents came to me and said, uh, the principal from Milan is here. I thought maybe they meant the current day principal. I, uh, they said, no, this is, was the principal in 1954. And I started doing some math thinking, what are the odds the principal from 1954 is still alive? <laughs> and sure enough, it was Cale. He and his daughter were visiting from Nebraska. And so we took the ring out of the case, put it right back on his hand and took a few photos. So at the museum, the game-winning shot, uh, it's, it's coin-operated, so you drop a quarter in the slot, a basketball comes down the chute, the clock starts with five seconds and it's ticking down, and if the ball goes through before the buzzer, the crowd goes wild, the score changes, your team wins. To some people, it's like a, it's like a Hollywood operation, like, you know, the, they're patting themselves on the back and we have a blue ribbon that says I hit the game winning shot at the Indiana Basketball Hall of Fame. It's really cool. Everybody from five year old kids to 95 year old men want to be the hero. They want to be the Bobby Plump, the Reggie Miller. They want to hit the, the game winning basket. In early 2021, with COVID still in effect, uh, we shut down the facility and we had uh, about uh, 10 weeks of renovations, uh, the most extensive renovations in the history of the building. Just trying to modernize the experience. Kids don't want to stand and stare at a trophy in a case or a jersey behind glass. They want to touch, they want to feel, they want to hear. Our record wall is also something we're really proud of. We now have 80 categories interactive that you can pull up at the touch of a finger. Who has the most career assists? What coach has won the most sectionals? Rather than taking 10 seconds to see what we used to have, you can literally spend 10 or 15 minutes now. When the Hall of Fame relocated to Newcastle, there were a lot of skeptics. They thought maybe this wasn't the best move. First and foremost, it's a community that is just <laughs> tried and true, a basketball town. The history that's here, the fanaticism that the community has had for the sport, there's, there's unquestionably a basketball support here. I can sit here 31 years after this place opened and say that it absolutely makes all the difference in what we have done and what we're able to do that we have volunteers who have been with us for 28, 29, 30, 31 years. Some of them who don't even really particularly care for basketball, they just are proud of their hometown. They're proud of such a tourist attraction being located in their hometown. And they just want to be a friendly face to greet people as they come in to see what we have at the museum. here in Newcastle and I remember uh, some of my earliest interactions at the library coming to the library as a child uh, with my mother and we would come to the children's library and you would walk down this um, stairwell to get down into the basement where the where the children's library was and then once you came through the stairwell it just opened up into this room full of books and shelves of books and I loved it you know I always knew where the books that I was interested in were you know I, I could go right to the shelf and pull out you know the Dr. Seuss books or you know when I got older the Nancy Drew books and all of those kinds of things so I just I love the library it's just a really special place in this community. 
I um, went to Ball State uh, after I graduated from high school here in Newcastle, and, and then I went to Indiana uh, University at IUPUI and got my master's in library science degree. And so it was, you know, I thought at the time that I would end up working, um, you know, maybe at Ball State in the academic library. And I was just getting ready to graduate when I saw an advertisement for a job position, um, the assistant director's position here at the Newcastle Henry County Public Library. And I remember thinking, wouldn't that be neat to work at my home library? And so I applied, and here I am, you know, 18 years later, um, the, as the director of the library, and it just, you know, it, it continues to be a very special place to me. The library tries very hard to um, promote early literacy and have a variety of story time programs and other programs that promote that so that you know our children's librarian while she's doing a story time for you know either whether it's babies or you know toddlers that kind of thing she's not only reading and engaging with the children she's also teaching the parents and the caregivers here's how you can do this at home and how um, you can help to instill this love of reading in your own child as well we've had various programs where we give a book so it's not you know take a book, borrow a book out of the library and bring it back. No, we want you to keep this book in your home because we realize the importance of that. Our friends of the library also are very involved in the community and at, at different um, you know, fairs when we have the back to school fair and things like that. The library is involved and our friends a lot of times will give away books to kids as well. So we, we try as much as we can to get books into people's hands. The library is much more than books. We provide resources that will enrich people's lives, and one of the new um, additions that we've had here is called a library of things, where we have just very unusual, you wouldn't normally think of the library as having uh, these items to check out, so we have things like telescopes and metal detectors. We now have a green screen for people who want to do some videoing and things like that. So it's. It's things that we think that people are going to, you know, find useful and interesting and that can help them in their everyday lives. Oh, I can help you out on Roman Sissy, but I can't see you at all. Been in the right culture, lady, and the right culture, lady. Here in the auditorium, we host music programs, we host, have movies, um, we've had just lots of different opportunities for people to come and have not only um, learning experiences because you know we want people to learn and, and grow that is part of our mission statement is that we provide resources for people to to learn and grow um, but we provide just fun things for people to do so a lot of craft programs and um, just some interesting you know lots of different interesting programs that we have here I remembered that I had seen histories here in Henry County, uh, Herbert Heller's, there's other history written uh, back in the 1890s uh, that had very, very little information about black Americans in, in those books. And I thought, there's gotta be something written about the contributions that black Americans have made here in this, in this county. So, you know, that's why I decided to start writing it. Personal accomplishments of note from uh, African Americans here in this county and, and in the city of Newcastle was probably goes back to 1891. J.G. Weaver was the first black American graduate from Howard University. Um, secondly would have been Elizabeth Bailey, first Newcastle High School black graduate, 1896. Rose City Male Chorus, which was um, a group of organized men, including the Thurman family, uh, Bassett family modlin family uh, they were they're well-known singers in the, in the 1930s and 40s from this area the first family that arrived was in 1827 um, that came to newcastle and that was the um, peter winslow family they actually settled around strawn indiana before moving to newcastle in 1827 by the 1840s there were 34 more families that arrived in henry county and newcastle area my own family uh, was one of those families in 1831 brought here by a baptist minister from west virginia 
um, near Springport, but you know, we, our family left here, but we eventually moved back here by the 1930s. Getting folks hired on to the police department and fire departments here goes back to the chapters of the NAACP. Um, first incarnation of that was in 1930. The president was Samuel Chris. Uh, in uh, 1957, Una Mae Winslow was a, a, a president of the chapter. It was instrumental in probably getting integration in the uh, lunch counters around town, as well as the uh, Princess Theater that was a movie theater where blacks were relegated to sitting upstairs. Um, by the 1980s, um, we had a young minister named Reverend Charles Harrison that came to town and uh, was uh, questioning why there were no black firemen, no black policemen, why were only blacks working in the city street departments on the trash trucks and things like that. So we uh, began to uh, write newspaper articles and question why that was. Uh, uh, situation resulted in, in me getting a cross burn in my front yard and oh, due to, to those newspaper articles that were written. It, it kind of scared my family to the point where my wife said, at the time said, you got to quit this. You can't do this. You know, you can't get, you're going to get our, our young children hurt. And so uh, we kind of backed off from writing any newspaper articles and things like that. Uh, Ed Walker was the president of the chapter at that time. But we did have a march uh, that culminated at the um, courthouse. Uh, but eventually, in conversations with uh, Mayor Bud Ayers, uh, we were able to uh, secure the uh, hiring of, of uh, Mark Boatwright Sr., Darren Clemens on the police department, and Fred Thurman as well on the fire department. I think people are most surprised about the, uh, the personal achievements that, that took place for, of the many African Americans that are within the book. Um, some of the chapters, uh, you know, that are also included in talk about the uh, military history, uh, church history, sports, but probably that's the most significant highlight. In the, in the 1800s, efforts for uh, abolition, underground railroad efforts that were, uh, that were put forth kind of brought about uh, a sense of um, cooperation between the races here in this, in this community as far back as those days. But the outcome, you know, uh, it's turned out pretty bright uh, overall. Uh, race relations here, you know, have improved to the point where um, it was just uh, a pleasure, really, to, uh, to live here. Robert Indiana was one of Newcastle's most famous citizens. He was born in Newcastle, Indiana on September 13, 1928, to an unwed 16-year-old mother who lived on Q Avenue. He was transported to Richmond, Indiana to stay with friends of the family for a period of a few months until he was adopted by Earl and Carmen Clark of Indianapolis. His mother was uh, peripatetic. Uh, she liked to move around a lot, and by the time he was 17, they had lived in 21 homes which made it difficult to make friends and difficult uh, with his schoolwork. But he persevered and excelled, graduating valedictorian of his class at Arsenal Tech, went on to the Army for three years, went to college for five years for free, came back and settled down in New York City in 1954. He had a first grade teacher that had told him earlier that, uh, Bobby, someday you're going to be a famous artist. He believed it, and that was his goal. He had a revelation, so to speak. Uh, he, he thought that things were going to happen, and he didn't like his old name, Robert Clark, and so he changed his name to Robert Indiana in homage to his state of Indiana. And for the next year or two, he tried to find a style that was just right for him, something that no one else was doing. And it was in 1961 that uh, he had a two-man show, very obscure, and just by chance, uh, the director of the Museum of Modern Art happened to see one of his works. It was called The American Dream. He was mesmerized by it and immediately purchased it for the Museum of Modern Art. And almost overnight, Robert Indiana skyrocketed to success. He liked to commemorate people in his life, places that he lived in, places he knew, and events. In 1969, he painted Newcastle number one, 
Very frequently my paintings relate to uh, places, uh, important places, places that mean something in particular to me. And of course, uh, Newcastle is uh, my birthplace. There's a 38 there because Highway 38 crosses the uh, Big Blue River at that particular place in Indiana. Probably his most famous work is L-O-V-E, L tilted O over the V-E, love. Uh, it is also one of the most uh, plagiarized works in, in art. And because of that, the, the art community and some artists thought that he had sold out and had gone commercial. And so he was ostracized in a terrible way by the art community. And it wasn't uh, too many years later, in 1978, he'd finally had enough of it and decided to leave New York City and go to Vinyl Haven Island, where he had a home already there, and finish out his last 40 years of life there. In 2015, a friend of mine, Aaron Dicken, was the director for the uh, Art Association of Henry County. And he was aware of Robert Indiana's connection to Newcastle and used his position to uh, pursue making contact with Robert Indiana. One day we got a phone call on the caller ID, it said Robert Clark, and the message was from one of his assistants and just said that, hey, this is uh, Valerie calling for Mr. Indiana, looking to speak with Aaron Dickin, and they hung up. So we at least had a phone number. Then I started calling um, instead of just writing letters. Uh, very persistent, probably moderately annoying, uh, but it worked because one day I called and he answered. I said, okay, well, if you can't come visit us, we'd love to bring some uh, of Newcastle to you. And uh, he agreed to that. We uh, went out the next week. We spent four days on the island. And uh, three hours one day we spent with Robert Indiana. He took us down to a studio and showed us uh, uh, artwork. Uh, we had uh, a wonderful time with Bob. And it was probably, of all the places I've been on Earth, that, that still ranks as the number one attraction. He wanted a picture. His uh, publicist and uh, uh, secretary were with us at that time, and one was documenting our trip with photos. And he said, how about a picture of the three boys from Newcastle? And so we sat down on a couch, and Aaron on one side, and I was on the other side, and we all smiling, and had our picture taken together a couple times, and it was a, it was a very nice moment. A lot of things happened after that. Newcastle embraced him and uh, the, the Indiana Parkway was uh, developed. Um, so we started looking at public art installations. Uh, we looked at uh, getting some different type of artists in the gallery. Sculptures were set up. Uh, we have two love sculptures, one here uh, near the library and one at the, uh, near the armory. Uh, they're great uh, photo ops for people that are in love if they want to have something great behind them. The trip to meet Robert Indiana was huge, both for the art center and the arts culture uh, of our community, but also for the city of Newcastle and Henry County. Robert Indiana was gracious, and he was kind, and he was funny, and a great man. It was a once-in-a-lifetime trip, and uh, a trip I'll never forget. Good evening, and thanks for joining us for the latest installment of Ball State PBS's Now Entering series as we visit Newcastle, Indiana. We've seen some great stories already. Hi, I'm Margaret Reeder, membership and individual giving manager here at Ball State PBS, along with my co-host, Michelle Kinsey, community engagement and grants manager. We are so happy you could join us this evening. Absolutely. The Now Entering series is a unique documentary project. Your friends and neighbors become the filmmakers to tell the story of your town, capturing what makes Newcastle special. We met some great people and heard some wonderful stories when we were there taping the storytellers interviews that you are seeing tonight. We know that you are loving this program and there is so much more to come, but first we need to hear from you. For 50 years, your support has made it possible for us to bring the programming that entertains and educates. Ball State PBS provides these rich experiences for our community.
The Ball State PBS production team spent some time visiting Newcastle to talk to the storytellers and learn about what makes this town special. We're here this evening not only to celebrate Newcastle, but to ask you to be a part of what makes Ball State PBS so special. Our members, your generous gift right now helps create more of the local programming you enjoy and want to see on Ball State PBS. Give us a call at 1-800-252-9472 or go online to ballstatepbs.org. We want to hear from you. Behind us, we have a phone bank featuring, the volu featuring volunteers and some of the storytellers you will see in tonight's program. Let's hear it, storytellers. Let's hear it, phone bank. Thanks for being here. Let's get those phones ringing and keep our volunteers busy. If you know folks who are from Newcastle and have moved away, let them know that they can go to BallStatePBS.org and watch the live stream right now. You can also watch us on the Ball State PBS Facebook page. Don't forget to leave us a comment about Newcastle at hashtag NENewcastle. Ball State PBS loves going out into the communities and connecting with you by providing the best in local programming, as well as providing fun and educational community engagement opportunities. We would love it if tonight you take just a minute and make that connection with us by calling in with your support. Every singer, single dollar makes a difference because it goes right back into serving you, your family, and our entire community. Call 800-252-9472 or go online at ballstatepbs.org. And when you do, when we hear from you, we'll send you the DVD of tonight's program to enjoy. Or maybe you want to send it to a friend or family member with your annual gift of $60 or more or a sustaining gift of just $5 a month. We'll send you the now entering DVD of the Newcastle program or with an annual gift of $108 or $9 a month. We'll send you two DVDs. Maybe you want to send one to a family member or friend. We have lots of bonus material on the DVD, including a look behind the scenes of our production day. Footage not seen in the program tonight, photos and more. All you have to do is give us a call. Talk to one of the phone volunteers at 1-800-252-9472 or go online to ballstatepbs.org. In addition to those great thank you gifts, you will also get access to Ball State PBS Passport. With your donation of $60 or more, you will have access to Passport, which is thousands of local and national programs. And the best thing about it, you can watch those programs whenever you want, wherever you want, on your favorite device using the PBS app. The Now Entering series is a partnership between Ball State PBS and the towns we visit. If you've been watching, you know that the stories tonight are being told by your friends and neighbors from Newcastle. You experience the town's character and culture through their perspective. They went out and shot the video, collected the photos, and then sat down with the Ball State PBS crew to tell the stories you're enjoying this evening. Now it's your turn to become a partner with Ball State PBS to ensure that the local programs like Now Entering can continue. Call 800-252-9472 or go online at ballstatepbs.org to make your gift of support. This series is one of my favorites because we get to hear your stories. And this is the only place you're going to find it, right here on Ball State PBS. As a Ball State PBS viewer, you know how important it is that everyone in your community has access to this important resource. When you make your donation of support online or over the phone, you're ensuring that everyone has equal access to the programs and resources here on Ball State PBS. From the vital in-depth news and documentaries to critical learning tools and services, the programs here improve and empower your community every single day. Thanks to your support, Ball State PBS can continue to bring and bring these programs and serve our community and the families connections to information, education, performances, and more. If you're already a member, thank you. Thank you for making all of these experiences available for everyone in our community. If you're not a member yet, please make your contribution today. 
252-9472 or ballstatepbs.org. And when you make that contribution, we have some great ways to say thank you. For a gift of $60 or just $5 monthly, you'll receive your very own copy of the now entering Newcastle DVD. And with your donation of $108 or $9 monthly, you'll get two DVDs, one for you and one to give to a friend. The DVD has bonus material not seen in this evening's program, including behind the scenes footage of the production day at the Newcastle Library, photos, interviews, and more. You'll receive our on-the-air program guide and access to Ball State PBS Passport, so make that call now. 1-800-252-9472 or give online at ballstatepbs.org to give now. We have several of the storytellers in studio with us tonight, and Michelle is with one of them now to chat about their experiences with now entering Newcastle. Michelle? Thank you so much, Margaret. You probably recognize this guy, Richard Bauslog, and he was the one who told the fantastic, what a touching story about artist Robert Indiana. Uh, Richard, tell me a little bit about uh, the process for you. Why did you decide to be one of our storytellers for this now entering Newcastle project? Well, ever since that experience in 2015, I thought that was a story worth telling. Uh, Robert Indiana, I, I read a 1978 interview and someone asked him, you were born in Newcastle, Indiana? He said, yes, but I know no one from Newcastle. And he said, I don't know which door to knock on to talk to someone. And he said, they're gonna have to come to my door. And so when Aaron Dickin made that connection, we made the trip, we knocked on his door and the rest was history. Wow, <clears throat> tell me a little bit more about that trip. What was it like going back and looking at the photos again and kind of reliving that amazing experience that you had with him? That's just, like I said in the video, it was a one, once in a lifetime trip. It's uh, looking at the photos again just brought back great memories. You know, we had heard that he was a, he was a recluse. We'd heard that he was a little cantankerous, hard to get along with. But our, our three hours with Bob were just wonderful. And he was such a gracious person. And so everything I'd heard had been dispelled right then. And <laughs> we made a friend, a friend for life. That's wonderful. Uh, I'm sure you've made a lot of friends this evening with uh, the story that, that you told. What was the interview experience like? You know, under the lights with our PBS crew. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and say it was probably a pretty comfortable, casual experience, much like this is now, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, your crew did a great job preparing yeah. us, uh, getting us at ease. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been in education all my life, and so getting in front of people is nothing. But uh, with cameras <laughs> and, uh, and lights on you, it's, it's a little different. It is a little extra. Yeah, yeah. and it, it, uh, it's, it's not discomforting, but it's... Uh, it's a little different. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm, I'm assuming you're glad that you told the story, Richard. Uh, why do you think it's important for others to hear this story about Robert Indiana? Well, he's such a remarkable artist. And I, until he created love, he was, a, a, he was considered a pop artist. Yeah. But he was just in the art circle. He was uh, a well-known name. Yes. After love, uh, when they, they thought he was sold out, then things went downhill, and I just think his story is just so, so wonderful. What he produced after Love is remarkable, but you don't see a lot of it. But it's, uh, I mean, his artwork, he continued creating art until 2013. That's wonderful. That's a long career. That's great. And I love that thanks to your story and thanks to, to the efforts of Newcastle to kind of get the word out that, that Robert Indiana is your guy, uh, that he is kind of synonymous <laughs> with, with Newcastle now. Thank you so much again for telling your story this evening, and we're gonna send it back to Margaret. Margaret? Thanks, Michelle. The Now Entering series is one of the most impactful things Ball State PBS does. Part of our mission is to be the local voice for communities of East Central Indiana, and this evening, we're bringing you the voices of Newcastle.
The wonderful people of Newcastle came together to help make this show possible. Thanks to everyone who's been calling in and supporting great local programs tonight and every day that only Ball State PBS, your local PBS station, can bring you. We'd also like to thank a few of our sponsors of now entering Newcastle. Thank you to our presenting sponsor, Citizen State Bank, the City of Newcastle, Henry County Destination Development, Henry County Health, and Henry County REMC. Remember, you can leave us a message about your memories of Newcastle or what you'd like to say about the show at hashtag NE Newcastle or share a message with one of our phone volunteers when you call in just like Kathy Nelson of Newcastle who's proud Yay. to be a Trojan. So thank you, oh Katie, I'm sorry, Katie Nelson. Thanks, Katie. We're proud of you being a Trojan, too. Won't you join, <laughs> Katie? Give us a call, 800-252-9472, or go online at ballstatepbs.org to make your gift of support. Our phone volunteers are waiting to hear from you. That's right. We are here celebrating the town of Newcastle, but there are all sorts of reasons to celebrate Ball State PBS, from programs that inform, educate and inspire, to educational and entertaining children's programs, to in-depth news, to the best in arts and cultural programming anywhere. What better way to support the station that brings you such a diverse range of national and local programming than to make a contribution right now? We make it easy for you. You choose the amount, you choose if you'd like a thank you gift, and you choose how you'd like to pay. It's that simple. So give us a call right now, 800-252-9472. I've been hearing the phones ringing. Let's keep it going or go online to ballstatepbs.org. And the easiest way to support Ball State PBS is by becoming a sustaining member. As a sustaining member, you never have to worry about renewing your support. You sign up to have your contribution automatically deducted from your bank account or credit card on a monthly basis, and then it's all set. And when you make that contribution, we have some great ways to say thanks. With your annual gift of $60 or more, or a sustaining gift of just $5 a month, we'll send you the now entering Newcastle DVD as a thank you gift. Or with an annual gift of $108 or sustaining gift of just $9 a month, we'll send you two DVDs. Before we head back to the program, let's take just a moment to thank some of the wonderful people who've, been, who've become members tonight in support of Ball State PBS, now entering Newcastle. We've heard from Richard of Newcastle, wonderful. who proposed in front of the love oh, sculpture. How great is that? I love that. Katie Nelson, who I mentioned earlier, yes. who's tr proud to be a Trojan. And I know there are a lot more of you out there who are proud to be Trojans, and we want to hear from you, as well as Sophia from Newcastle, who became Fantastic. a member for the first time tonight. Oh my goodness, thank you so much, Sophia. And I know that a lot of people, there are some people on the phone right now. We've got more people with comments. Uh, they're coming in, they're rolling in, and we will get to those. But we just wanted to take a moment to thank you so much for taking the time to pick up the phone or go online and support Ball State PBS, the, the station that is bringing you the awesomeness that is now entering Newcastle. Right, That's Margaret? right. And now I think we want to get back to the program. So let's get back to now entering Newcastle. When I was uh, in the uh, sixth grade, that's the first time I ever walked into that uh, beautiful facility, the world's largest and finest high school gym. My brother, uh, Ron, he was my first athletic hero. He played basketball for Blue River Valley, and uh, the sectional was always held at the field house, of course. And my brother got to play in the sectional, and I, I got to go see him play in that, in that beautiful facility. When you walk into the Newcastle field house, the gym floor is down. You walk in and you look down and there it is. And uh, that, that was so unique to me at that time, I had never seen anything like that. And the first time I walked in there, I walked in, I looked down and got a little dizzy. But it was a good kind of dizzy. I thought, wow, this, this place is really, really something. I was just in awe. 
It's interesting, Newcastle's basketball history, for many years they played in a facility that was very small and yet the Hoosier hysteria bug had really hit folks here very hard. Uh, we had a lot of good players over the years. People loved basketball and they wanted to go see the games. And the Church Street Gym, which was the site of the very famous Ray Pavey, Jimmy Rail shootout. The, the joke about that game is that uh, 10,000 people must have been there to see it when it only seats about 2,500 people. There was a need, a definite need for a bigger facility. And then uh, uh, as things happened with Milan winning the state championship over Muncie Central, Marvin Wood was looking to move up. He was the coach of those Milan Miracle Boys. And so Newcastle became uh, uh, very interesting to him because there was talk of building a brand new basketball facility here. And Marvin decided to come to Newcastle and uh, they were talking about building it and talking about building it, but they couldn't get the drive off the ground and eventually he got frustrated and left. And I think that's what turned the tide, made people think, you know, we gotta start, stop talking about this, we gotta do it now. They uh, started a campaign called Gym Now, and uh, it was one of those team efforts. It was very much like a basketball effort. One of the greatest coaches here, Sam Walford, always talked about role players, that everybody had a role to play. And, and I, I look back, and as I've read and talked to people about the Gym Now campaign, people played their roles beautifully. There were, there were some able to give more than others, but everybody, it seems, pitched in because they wanted to see this become a reality. They all combined together and in a year and a half, which really is an amazingly quick time when you think about it, they had raised $200,000 and that was the foundation for what would become the largest and finest high school gymnasium in the world. I'm so glad that uh, there have been people in this community who have been dedicated to keeping it up, to making improvements to it. It's got that beautiful parquet floor now. But when word got out, word finally got out that nationally, statewide and nationally, that hey, Newcastle only has 7,200 seats now. Uh, and then uh, Seymour, I think, claimed to be number one at that point. There were folks in the community that said, we're not gonna, we're not gonna stand for this. And uh, uh, Sam Alford got together with others and decided to have a golf outing. And it was a who's who of Newcastle basketball that came back for that golf outing. And at that golf outing, they raised a substantial amount of money, enough money to buy a new set of bleachers. And so they made sure that Newcastle was number one. Again, it's a, it, it's a point of community pride. It means so much to people here. It is a crown jewel of this community and I think will be for years and years to come. There are so many great memories that have been made in that gymnasium. The Historical Society formally organized in the year 1887. Before that, in 1867, Benjamin S. Parker wrote an article for our local newspaper about the need for a historical society. Um, no one was interested, but five years later, about 1871, an old settlers club formed where they met annually. It took a little while, but the actual historical society formed in 1887 because of the efforts of Benjamin S. Parker. The historical society would meet on a regular basis, usually at the courthouse. Um, they would present papers during their meetings about historical topics, but eventually it became recognized that there was a need for a museum to hold a collection. The museum is actually in the home of Civil War General William Gross. Um, he had his 16-room mansion built in 1870, and Gross himself passed away in the year 1900. And in 1901, Henry County 
purchased the home for the express use of a museum for the historical society. Today, if you came to the museum, some of the items that you would see um, include two automobiles, a 1911 Maxwell that was built in Newcastle, and a 1930 Chrysler that was also built in Newcastle. We also have a baby grand piano made by the Jesse French Piano Company, which was um, a mass producer of pianos, also located here in Newcastle. And one other item that you really just have to come to the museum to see is a desk. And it was built by the architect of General Gross's home. The desk itself contains 357 species of wood and almost 57,000 different pieces inlaid. It is a one-of-a-kind treasure that you have to come see. We receive donations, contributions, actually quite often. Usually items of historical value that have either been made or used in Henry County and financial contributions, and we are very grateful for those. The best thing about the artifacts are the stories that go with them. We have uh, approximately 200 members in the Historical Society, and we had around 800 visitors in 2019. We are so grateful for what we've received in the past, and now we are looking at items from around the 1960s up until today, because it's hard to believe, but in 100 years, people will want to see what we used and made and worked with and read. So we do have a, an old Apple computer that has been donated and um, old cell phones. But for things like the pandemic, um, in 100 years, people will want to know how we dealt with that, how, how we got through it. The importance of the Historical Society in, for Newcastle and the entire county is its mission has stayed the same for 134 years. We are there to educate the public and anyone who's interested in Henry County. And we are there to preserve the history of Henry County for future generations and to honor those who have come before us. Well, Secret Families here in Henry County has been around for about six years. One night, my wife and I were sitting home, realizing the kids were going to be gone to college and out of the house, and we decided we needed something to do. So I decided, and I said, let's do some charity work. And she said, well, you love Christmas, so how about a Christmas charity? Well, not 12 hours later, the next morning, a man from Muncie named Al Holdren came in and said, I need someone to start a Christmas charity here in Henry County. And I think my, the hair on my arm stood straight up. Lightning was coming through the ceiling. It, it was a life-defining moment. Well, we started with helping seven families, and now we're up to about 80 families. We fundraise during the year. Then in October, we reach out to the local schools and ask them to give us the names of the families who are in the most need. We reach out to the families with a very confidential, loving telephone call to get the names, ages, sizes, the clothing, wants, what toys the kids need, um, everybody in the house, not just the school age kids, but the younger kids and all the adults in the house, we find out what they really are lacking. We are secret family, so we keep the names of the donors and the recipients secret. They don't intermingle. They don't know where the money came from or exactly who it's going to. On the second Saturday in December, we descend on Walmart at 6 a.m. with about 100 volunteers and these volunteers are going to do the shopping for us. Each group of about two to five people will take one of the spreadsheets for the family, they're given a budget, and they go through the store and they buy what they need. The clothes, the toys for the kids, if the parents need things for work or clothing or cooking items and even things such as eating utensils and plates, they buy those things. We even encourage the shoppers to go over the budget because when they go over the budget, they get to pull out their own pocketbook and donate immediately to the family right there. 
by spending their own money, the family will receive more than what we had budgeted for them. About half the time, I would say, the shoppers spend more than what the budget is and help the family immediately. We run them through the cash register and pay for them. And then they're all taken down to a church here in Newcastle, and we have another couple hundred volunteers that wrap each present individually for each recipient. We then have about another hundred people who take all the gifts out and deliver them to the families. A couple years ago, the football team was helping us do deliveries, and it's always nice to have a bunch of young, strong guys carrying in Christmas trees. At one house they went to, the boys carried in a tree and set it up, and the family was a single mom and her nine-year-old daughter. And the daughter just got so excited, and she looked to her mom and she said, Mom, look, it's our first Christmas tree. And everybody was just touched by that. Everybody left the house in tears. It just, that's the help we want to bring to people. People who have never had the Christmas experience, we want to bring that to them. There's always been a lot of people in the community who wanted to help people in need, and especially at Christmas time. They want to volunteer, they want to donate. We just provided them with a really good vehicle to do that. I love Newcastle because it's a very generous and giving community. I'm Travis Wyke. I'm the managing editor of the Courier Times newspaper here in Newcastle. The newspaper itself is 181 years old and it started as uh, two different papers. There was the Courier and there was the Times. They merged and they came under one family. It was the Chambers family who were uh, local media and they were also involved with the community in huge ways for a long time. Uh, since then, it's been uh, the one newspaper for, well now coming up on, on 100 years itself as the Courier Times as that entity. And uh, we've been in downtown Newcastle uh, since then. I started working for the newspaper uh, six years ago. I came in as the education reporter and then the opportunity came up for me to uh, apply for the editor position. The most noticeable thing for the Courier Times specifically is that it's not as as busy locally uh, anymore and um, I explain that to people a lot is that we're still going into the office. The, the production side of it has shifted and we're able to use the cloud to, to type up our stuff and, and you know, uh, ship it out and then it prints. They bring it in a, in a truck every night and we drop it off. Uh, the other noticeable uh, change in the past couple years is we now partner with the uh, post office to deliver all of our home delivery papers. And what that does is it creates a more consistent uh, delivery service. I, I've never seen somebody print off a Facebook post and stick it on the fridge. Never seen that, but I've had, um, I've talked to 13 year olds who were in the paper for their uh, track meet and, and they cut that out and, and it, it goes in a scrapbook or it, it's on the fridge, everybody can see that. Um, or it's, you know, tacked up on the wall on a, uh, in your cubicle or, or, or at the office or something. And when we have obituaries, people save obituaries. But again, that is different, cutting that out as you know, this piece of this uh, memoriam for somebody versus just printing off a web page. It just looks different, it feels different. And that's a big part of it. People try to pin me down, but um, like my job's not to have an opinion or to voice my opinion, it's to say, here's how you feel about it, and here's why you feel this way, and here's how they feel about it, and why. And now it's in the same place, and it, it's a conversation. I love Newcastle because of the people and the passion that they have. They have their, their parts of the community, their hyper-local parts of the community that they want to protect and that they want to see do better. They want their kids to do better. They want their sports teams to do better. And that's, that's what I love about Newcastle is there's always somebody doing something to make it better. There's currently probably in the neighborhood of 80 members that's in the Newcastle Optimus Clubs. We started with the flag project, we call it, in uh, 1963. 
started out uh, our main purpose is for patriotism and supporting the youth in the community. This is our fundraiser. Currently we put out over 200 flags in the local businesses and around the community every year. It really makes you feel proud that you're an American and a, and a citizen of Newcastle. It uh, really brings back just the patriotism that's out there and it sure does bring the, the community together. When we put the flags out, and people will go by and honk and wave, and, and that, that really just makes you feel proud. The uh, two main things that we do, we give out two $1,000 scholarships to the high school seniors every year. We also have a youth appreciation banquet, which every year that's awarded to 23 different high school seniors. Uh, TriStar Basketball is a free thing for the kids ages 8 to 13. It's held once a year that we, we put that on. Sheriff's Youth Camp, those are just to name a few. I stay involved with the Optimist Club uh, for several different reasons. One, I'm a business owner and I like to give back to the community for the same town that I uh, have a business in and raise my family in. The main thing is uh, we, we, we really like the youth of the community and they're our future leaders. Well, how about this? Newcastle's Little League team is on its way to the World Series in Williamsport, Pennsylvania. You know, 2012 um, is a year after Danny Smekins passed away, who was the coach of this team back when this group of kids was 7, 8, 9, 10, won a couple state championships when they were 9 and 10. And then he passed away after the 10 year old state championship a few months later because he wanted to be there to pitch batting practice and it'd back kill him. Get ready for the game, change shirts, and come out. And he never came out except for the game. Me and Danny Smekins, we actually played on the same team in Little League, but we just had a great chemistry. It was meant to be. He did it for the right reasons. He didn't want to be suffering in bed or a hospital. He wanted to be coaching his last days. So he passed away, and I promised that I would stick around, even though I was looking to go to Tennessee for work, but I had to stick it out for these kids and, uh, and for Danny. The 10th inning um, of the state semifinals against Jeffersonville, a three and a half hour game. Uh, Caden Smekins is up in the 10th inning, bases loaded, and with a 3 1 pitch. Uh, three balls, one strike, and he steps out of the box, looks at me, and I just pop my chest where I had a baseball, picture from baseball with his dad's name, Smeck, on there. And he points to the sky like Babe Ruth and blasts a home run, 70 feet over the fence. And I mean, it was just unbelievable, surreal moment. We went to the 2012 regionals, and the whole town was shut down. Businesses were watching from their businesses and home and calling in sick, I'm sure, because the whole school literally shut down and let them go to the games. So the whole stands were literally painted green, faces green, and we had a big rain delay against Kentucky, down five to one. The Newcastle kids didn't just have to fight back to overcome the big deficit. They had to wait out a half hour rain delay on a cool afternoon that veered back and forth from sunny to a downpour and ended in bright sunlight. But come back, they did. We tried to motivate them and pump them up in the dugout because we just didn't we look like our backs against the wall again. But then Newcastle brought on its best pitcher, Bryce Pinkard, who hadn't started because of mandatory little league pitch counts and he shut down Kentucky the rest of the way. We come out and that, after that rain delay and just started hit, 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 hit. Meanwhile, Newcastle clawed its way back, tying the game on a home run in the fifth and winning on a two out bases loaded single in the sixth. Uh, my favorite moment from the Little League World Series run, um, even though it wasn't the World Series, it had to be us just beating Kentucky in the regional championship to send us to Williamsport. The way we won, the celebration afterwards, it was, that was something I'll never forget. I believe that we had an angel in a grandstand and Danny Smekins, and it was fate, karma, destiny, all of the stuff wrapped up in one. It was meant to be. Next morning, we're going to Williamsport, Pennsylvania. We go through security, and I, I get on a plane, I realize half these kids have never flown. <laughs> I'm like, wow, and it's just me and two other coaches are responsible for these 12 kids. So first of all, you get off, we get off the bus at like 9 p.m., and there's the mountains right there, and down there is the lit up diamond. It's the pinnacle of youth sports, you know? I mean, Every kid grows up seeing Little League Baseball would even played baseball. Wow, I'd love to be. That looks unbelievable. I mean, there's no other sport, no other level for that kid, that level of kid that can be on that spotlight and be like the Beatles signing autographs everywhere they go. The first night we played in front of 13,000 people there in a national TV audience again, of course. Um, and we won that first game against Oregon and it was just, like Caden said when he was pitching, I was nervous at first because, you know, it's a big deal. You know, Newcastle had never been there, but and so he, he had the first couple pitches of just like another baseball game. And he's just out there just doing his thing. And we're doing our thing. And so many things were first for them kids and first for us and the town along the way. Before the Little League World Series, I knew that sports can connect people on a different level. 
but whenever I was able to witness it firsthand, sharing a barrack with players from Uganda, it was a really cool experience and to be able to stay connected with them today is pretty cool. And one thing I learned from the tournament is to never take anything for granted. Our team was lucky enough to have a dorm right next to the Uganda team and hearing their story of their life and their journey to Williamsport was very eye-opening to all of us and we are grateful to have met such awesome people. Uh, my favorite memory from the World Series was definitely trading pins. I remember back in the day, I started with one single pin and then uh, I ended up with two full pin books of them, probably worth over $1,000 now. So that was probably my best memory from then. Um, I think my favorite memory of the World Series is when me and my mom gave one of the players from the Uganda team a Chips Ahoy chocolate chip cookie and he had never had one before, and he thought that it was the best thing in the world. He didn't have to be the biggest um, city in the world, you know. Here we are with 17,000. We ended up getting fifth place in the U.S., ninth in the world. These 11 and 12 year olds had no idea what the impact they had on the community. The branches of all this stuff and the alumni of Newcastle that really just got fired up to watch Newcastle Public League Baseball, it was just awesome. And I'm just very proud of that for the community, for the kids, and for the Little League program. Everywhere you go, people were telling you how great you did and just how proud they were of you and the team. Yeah, I love Newcastle because it's home. Uh, it's where my family's at. I'm just proud to be able to help put us on the map. I loved that story. I love all this really stories, beautiful. but that one, summertime, perfect time to talk about baseball and I believe the Little League World Series is going on right now so how appropriate is that and guess what Margaret Tell I'll me. be talking to two of the Newcastle players in just a few minutes so you're right going to want to stay the tuned studio, in the studio live Lucky so you're you. going to want to stay Lucky tuned you. for that wow I'm Michelle Kinsey along with Margaret Reeder and we're taking just a quick break from the program thanks for joining us this evening for now entering Newcastle we want to remind everyone that in addition to watching us on your TV tonight, we are streaming live at BallStatePBS.org and on Facebook. Be sure to comment with hashtag NENewCastle when you do go there. Thanks to everyone who has called in with your support. I believe Margaret, look at that stack of names that Margaret has. Margaret, who the, should we thank? The phones, the phones have been ringing and we love to hear from you. And I'm telling you, Michelle, the folks who are calling in are so excited about this show, and so that. are we. Let yes. me tell you, Daniel Buchanan of yeah. Newcastle says it's a great community to raise your kids. He played basketball here and got a basketball scholarship, which is so wow. cool, and just moved back to Newcastle, coming home again. We've heard from Rebecca Radford. Sally Mills says, thank you so much, Ball State PBS, for featuring our beloved city and county. We love seeing our stories told. Um, from Aaron, we've heard my family is happy to be from Newcastle and proud of the history here. Love that. And Sherry says, I'm so glad I watched this program. Newcastle was my home. And Lisa, one more, Lisa says, Newcastle is a great place to raise a family. I love that. Really? And the phones are ringing right now. We, we want love you to call in. You. And there are a lot of people watching on Facebook right now. You can watch us on the Ball State PBS Facebook page. There are some great comments. Sherry Vandergriff says, I am so glad I watched this video. Newcastle was my hometown, and I learned so many things I did not know. Love it. Jeff and Jewel Mendenhall, awesome program. I was born and raised in Newcastle. Was great to learn so much more about it. Thank you so much for sharing. Go Trojans, we've been hearing that a lot tonight. Beverly Smith Matthews says, I love PBS. We love you, Beverly. It's true. Yeah, <laughs> Katie Klontz, I believe that's right. Katie, I'm sorry if I didn't pronounce that correctly. She says, I have lived, whoop, I have lived in Newcastle my entire life and graduated from Ball State with a journalism degree. Whoop, and I just lost her. She just went away. <laughs> anyway, whoop, oh, there we go. I served as managing editor of the local newspaper, the Courier Times, for three years. It has been great watching this program and seeing so many familiar faces. Richard Bauslog was my elementary school principal. Newcastle is a fantastic place to live, work, and raise a family. How lovely is that? You know that? what's so great? And uh, 
hearing hearing the boys in the last segment talk about the connections that they make yes. and hearing all of you calling in and talking about mm -hmm. those connections you have to yes. this community whether you still live there whether you've gone on to the world and those connections are really beautiful um, now entering gives local communities an opportunity to have a voice and to become visual storytellers, just like you're seeing tonight. Fall State PBS spent the day at the Newcastle Library working with the storytellers to create the now entering Newcastle episode you're watching right now. Everyone had so much pride when they were telling their stories and Ball State PBS takes pride in being able to bring you quality local programs like Now Entering. Let us know if you're enjoying this evening's show by giving us a call at 1-800-252-9472 or go online to ballstatepbs.org and make a contribution. When you give a gift of $60 or a sustaining gift of just $5 a month, you'll receive the Now Entering DVD as a thank you. The DVD has bonus footage that you'll be not be seeing in tonight's broadcast, but it'll include behind the scenes footage of production day, extra interviews, and lots of photos. If you contribute $108 or a sustaining gift of $9 a month, we'll send you two DVDs of now entering Newcastle. On Ball State PBS, you'll find programs that cover a wide world of information, culture, and education, like this program, where we're learning all about our wonderful neighbors in Newcastle. It's something Ball State PBS brings to you every day, an appreciation for the community and world around you, allowing you to see things in a different light. Member support like yours is especially important and powerful as we plan more local programs and community outreach activities. By calling one of our phone volunteers, the awesome people behind me right now, and making a financial contribution, you can ensure that we will always be able to bring you a variety of engaging experiences all day, every day. It just takes a few minutes to do that. Join us online at ballstatepbs.org or call 800-252-9472. And thank you for making more great public television possible right here on Ball State PBS. Ball State PBS believes that people want to understand the world around them and that everyone can benefit from access to the arts, nature, science, and innovation. And that is why we invest in programs like NOVA, Nature, Masterpiece. It's why we produce local shows such as Wellness Matters, The Roundtable, and Now Entering. It's why we partner with many community organizations on projects that focus on education, health, and economic development. When you make your donation of support, you're ensuring that everyone has equal access to the programs and resources here on Ball State PBS. This is your chance to help sustain and support the station and your community and that you enjoy and watch every day. If you're already a member, thank you. If not, now's the time. Make your contribution by giving us a call at 1-800-252-9472. And when you make that contribution, we have some great ways to say thank you. That's absolutely right, Margaret. If you make a gift of support tonight with a contribution of $60 or a sustaining gift of $5, we'll send you the now entering Newcastle DVD. And if you can give a little more with a gift of $108 or a sustaining gift of just $9, you'll receive two DVDs of now entering Newcastle as a thank you. The DVD is full of bonus material not in tonight's program, including behind the scenes at production day at the library, more photos and extra interviews. And don't forget, with your qualifying donation, you can take advantage of a very special member benefit called Ball State PBS Passport. Passport brings you thousands, not kidding, thousands of hours of great PBS and local programs whenever you want on the PBS app, your streaming player, phone, or tablet. You can catch up on shows that you may have missed or revisit some of your favorites. And the best part is you can watch whenever you want. It's a one-of-a-kind benefit that comes with supporting Ball State PBS. So call now, 800-252-9472, or go online at ballstatepbs.org. 
Our world is filled with never-ending wonders that amaze, surprise, and delight us. And one of the great things about this series is that it celebrates all the wonderful stories of East Central Indiana, the history, the school spirit, the people, the uniqueness of each town. For almost 50 years, Ball State PBS has been committed to bringing all of this into your home. Our purpose is clear, to be an invaluable resource of news, ideas, and inspiration for our community. Your donation is really an investment in your community, helping ensure that there will always be community-centered programs right here on Ball State PBS, and making sure that everyone has access to essential learning tools and educational resources that really make a difference. Our Newcastle phone volunteers are waiting to hear from you. Give us a call, 800-252-9472, or you can go online at ballstatepbs.org. Now it's time to head over to Michelle to talk to some more of our storytellers. Michelle. Thank oh, thank you so much, Margaret. And I have got Naya yep. and Blake, and you may recognize them from the last segment because they were involved in the Little League World Series. Uh, the big game, and so I have to know you guys because we have a monitor set up, and so they've been watching the show uh, as it's been going on. How did you feel when you saw yourselves? You were 12, right? What did it feel like seeing yourselves back then, reliving that? Definitely weird because I was a lot smaller, <laughs> but I mean, it was just so long ago. It was nine years now, and I mean, I don't remember too much of it, which is, I mean, I remember going to Little League World Series, but just such a long time ago and it's crazy I, I wish I still had that 12 year old mind so I could relive it and yeah, just right I'm sure like on. it's stories like this and when you have the opportunity to collect uh, photos and videos and you get to do uh, little segments like you guys did to help your coach out um, tell me about you know the, the feeling you got in seeing those pictures and things again Blake, did it bring back some of those memories? Was it like, oh my gosh, yeah, I remember that. Oh that yeah, was awesome. it definitely brought back a lot of the great memories. I remember, you know, walking around there. We thought we were all big time celebrities, <laughs> signing autographs, oh talking my gosh. on, yeah. you know, reporters and stuff. And yeah. Obviously, it was something none of us had experienced before. And, sure. and then when we come back, I don't think we realized like how many people really followed it until like you were just out and you just see random people wearing Great Lake shirts or no Newcastle All Stars and. So that was awesome. It was great. The whole community was really behind us. That's so cool. And I understand there was a big celebration. It was at like at the Ball Diamond. Did yeah. they have a big celebration? Yeah. yeah um, there were some reporters out there, and just all the all of the our teammates, and then the coaches were out there, and Brett was talking on the mic and stuff. But like it was packed full. Wow. All the the whole outfield, the whole infield of the diamond, and then also outside the diamond, people just lined up in their cars, just came to listen and just see like the cool festivities that were going on for That's us. That's awesome. Do you remember how you felt? Because I think during the segment it said that at one of the games the crowd was what, 10,000? Oh, More than mm -hmm. 10,000 yeah. people. Yeah. What is that like for a 12 year old to expect to go out and play baseball in front of 10,000 people instead of what, like your games in Newcastle would draw what, for, a couple oh, hundred? Yeah. 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 For a little So yeah. 10,000. Tell me what that's like. like I think when it first really hit, I remember when we played Kentucky yeah. and we were walking out to the field and literally the entire, our whole section was full, the entire outfield was green and white and that realized, I don't know how many thousands of people were there that game and then the first time on the main field the Little League World Series, it was crazy just looking around seeing the whole outfield full, the whole stands were full, it was crazy. That's awesome. And you mentioned Naya, the 12 year old mind, when I was asking them before we went live on camera, like what they remembered the most. Blake, what did you say you remembered that you got? You got like several months or something of what? Free Jack's Donuts. Anytime we were <laughs> donuts. going into Jack's Donuts, That's what they remembered. it was on there. Oh, yeah. so that was probably the best part. Can't forget that. I mean, for a 12 year old, yeah. come on now. Unlimited Donuts, that's pretty cool. Thank you so much for coming by and uh, sharing your story a little bit more about your experience that's really really awesome yep, thanks thank for you. having thanks us we appreciate it margaret back to you thanks michelle 
We're having such a good time in the studio here tonight. We're hearing from so many of you, and this is really fun. Remember, we're also streaming live, so if you have friends or family who don't live in our viewing area, they can watch us online at ballstatepbs.org or on our Facebook page. And make sure to comment about your memories or your stories about Newcastle, or just say hi. Use the, the hashtag NE Newcastle. We've got, a, we've got so many more fun stories. I, I love the one Jan called in and said that she and her husband met cruising down Broad Street, which is great <laughs> fun. Angela says, I'd like to say hello to my family, the Buchanans, and just love to hear about Newcastle. Patricia Cronk, who is a, this is a name that I recognize, a member here um, at uh, Ball State PBS and Indiana Public Radio. Thanks, Patricia. We're happy to have you join us tonight. Brenda from Newcastle says Newcastle is a great place to grow up and raise a family and honored to be able to serve as clerk and treasurer of Newcastle and says hi to Daryl, who's behind me hey, here. Hey. Uh, Lana Enslow, who's Richard's sister, I think. Look at all these connections we're making. My hometown, left for many years, came back home, happy to be back. Um, and then we heard from a friend who left Newcastle in 1941, right. moved to Indianapolis and lived there now. And when they heard the program tonight was in Newcastle, they assumed it was England and then realized it was their hometown and was so happy. That is so exciting. I keep I hearing this that. hometown. It's a theme tonight, right? It's my hometown. I still support a lot of things. They're very proud. And that's from John Cleveland. So thanks to everyone, everyone who's called in. And if you haven't called in, we want to hear from you. 800-252-9472 or ballstatepbs.org. We also want to thank some of our sponsors. Um, sponsors make this program possible. So thanks to Doug, Muir State Farm, ERA, Integrity Real Estate, NC Brown Funeral Services, Indiana Basketball Hall of Fame, Jack's Donuts, McGowan Insurance, and the Newcastle Henry County Chamber of Commerce. That is quite an impressive list. That is a lot of support for this program. The Now Entering program is just one of the ways Ball State PBS connects with communities in our viewing area. If your town is interested in becoming a part of Now Entering, let us know. The Now Entering project has been a fun way for us to make new friends and engage new members, as well as tell everyone about the great neighbors around them. And remember, you can get your own DVD copy of Now Entering Newcastle when you call 800 252-9472. Our phone volunteers, many of them are the amazing storytellers you're seeing tonight in the program, are waiting to talk to you. So we want to thank everyone who's involved, everyone who's participating tonight, and keep those phones ringing. We want to get back to the program now. So back to now entering Newcastle. I love Newcastle because of its natural beauty. And I'm here to talk about my work fighting invasive species, particularly at Westwood Park, where we worked for the last 104 days in a row through cold and snow and freezing rain and the warm days of spring. This is Sting. Sting spends more time with me than my husband does. He obviously was named from Lord of the Rings. I think he looks like he's smiling. We started a group called HC Rips. Henry County removes invasive plant species. So we started teaching people about invasive species. And I put a post out on Facebook that said, I've cleared my land of honeysuckle. Are there any neighbors that could use help? Annie Wilson responded and she said, Westwood needs an intervention. And so she and her husband, Don, the next day, took me out to Westwood Park. Oh my gosh, my eyes got big. Number one, it was so infested. I mean, it was just a wall of bush honeysuckle. You could hardly see the trees. It was horrible. And yet it was wonderful because this is what I love to do. It goes up and then it spreads out. And when you get to take it away, you free up all that land under it. It's so cool. 
and our parks are undermanned and underfunded and they can't handle this onslaught of invasive species. It takes a lot of time and that's why they need volunteers knowledgeable enough to go in there and help the park staff to clear our parks so they can be beautiful living landscapes for the birds, the bees, and the butterflies, and better for people. So I called the park director, Jan Kreider, the very next morning and said, hey, we would like to work on your invasive shrubs for the next two months. We'll supply the manpower, the tools, the spray, the expertise, because we know the good plants and the bad plants. All we need you to do is take care of the sticks. So he said, okay. So that very afternoon, I went out with my loppers and started cutting. And I almost immediately called my husband. And I said, Tom, there's autumn olive here. Autumn olive is humongous, way too big for my loppers. It's like an upside down octopus with its head down and these huge arms going out like 20 feet. And it requires a real chainsaw. So Tom came out with his electric chainsaw and cut that autumn olive. And he worked with me then the next 102 days clearing these invasive shrubs in Westwood Park. And actually in one month, we made it to where I thought we would take the whole time. And then we started going down the bike trail and we got to where we could first see the 300 year old oak tree which actually had an Asian bittersweet vine coiling around it that was going to smother it like a boa constrictor. So I cut that vine. We found, we got to the first bridge and it had this beautiful little creek that went out to the lake, but you couldn't even see it because it was completely covered with thorny multiflora rose. It was like Sleeping Beauty's castle. And multiflora rose is my expertise. And when I cut it down, all of a sudden you could see the creek flowing into the lake. I called it Helen's Creek. It was just beautiful. And then we crossed the second bridge. And when you cross the second bridge, the path goes off to the left. But Tom looked straight ahead and said, I think there used to be a path here closer to the lake. And he started cutting there. He cut there every single day for a month. And he not only opened up this new path, but he would cut down the slope that led to the lake. So as you walk this path, you could see the opening to the whole lake. And as we worked day after day, you could see the dog walkers and the hikers and the mountain bikers start to take what we called Tom's secret path. It's good for my personal health. It's great exercise, a good upper body, good lower body, good core. And I found with this winter and COVID and everything, if I spent a whole day in the house, I got depressed. But if I go outside and I'm challenging the elements and I'm there in freezing rain, cutting these honeysuckles, making the world better, boy, it's a better life for me. Westwood Park is just a drop in the bucket. It's an 800 acre park and we cleared four acres. But we figured that a drop in the bucket can cause ripples, and ripples can cause waves, and waves can cause tsunamis, and we can get more people out there fighting invasive species. My name is Michael Grant. I was the last class that went to the old seventh grade building. My favorite teacher in seventh grade was Mr. Stark. He was my math teacher, and math was my favorite subject at that time anyways. But he rode a motorcycle to school sometimes, and I forget how it happened, but I said something to him about, well, you, you know, you can give me a ride on that motorcycle home. And he said, well, bring a helmet. So I, and the next day I took a helmet with me. So we went in the office and he called, and my mom said, yeah, I told him you can give him a ride home. So he gave me a ride home on his motorcycle. <laughs> It used to be a high school. I think it was for all grades, all the way from elementary, I think, all the way through high school. It was in 1923 when they first used it for high school. The students that were going from 10th through 12th grade, it was in 1958, they you know went away from that building. And in 72, they made it just the seventh grade building. After seventh grade went out, 
they made it for the alternative school. And then they made it, it's a men's homeless shelter now. And downstairs of there, they have uh, like a thrift store, I guess. I've spent my whole life here in Newcastle and I'm a very sociable guy. I like to talk to people. And I talk to a lot of people here. It's just a wonderful town. I have my support dog, her name's Bella. I've had her for 11 years and she loves to go everywhere and everybody loves Bella. She, her favorite place to go is Real King, see? <laughs> she knows that name, Real King. <laughs> I love Newcastle because there's a lot of good friendly people and I like to visit with them and it's just a wonderful place to be. The Henry County Community Foundation has been here in Newcastle Incorporated since 1985. So we celebrated our 35th year last year. Every dollar that's donated to us, if you're the donor, you tell us what you want us to do with the money. So you may have um, a field of interest that you care about, you know, the environment, animals, helping children, uh, making parks better or creating more open spaces. So we do that with the money. Some of the big things uh, that we've been able to do by partnering with other organizations are we helped get Ivy Tech here. When uh, they came in 2013, we were a big part of that. We also help with uh, the Humane Society and helping kids and families. Uh, we have over 60 volunteers at the foundation, including our board of directors. And so it's just like everybody is involved. If you ever gave any money to the foundation, you're involved as well as myself as being director and everyone that works in the office operating it, making sure that we're taking care of the donation that you did give us. People have donated their money and because we've grown, we're able you know, to pay out like over $600,000 a year in community grants as well as that much in scholarships to local kids that go to college to help them prepare them for the future in a better economic Newcastle. I was director for 10 years there. The new director, Jennifer Fox, she's taken over and I, I think already she's doing a wonderful job. So I'm in kind of an elite group five directors total and I was one of those five so I feel really blessed to be able to do that. It's uh, just the most amazing organization ever. I've been a trails board member. Of course there's no conflict of interest here because everyone involved you know we encourage them to be in a nonprofit and care about something in the community. So Healthy Communities had established a fund at the Community Foundation, so therefore they get an annual income from that fund. They actually operate five trails. Part of a portion of the trail connects with the Cardinal Greenway. The rest of them are all in Henry County. And Wilburite Trail, which is our most popular, the Wilburite Trail is actually here in Newcastle. We have a trailhead at the YMCA, and we have a trailhead out at 103. But um, the best thing is that when we were helping to build these trails, you know, not a lot of people understood what they were um, to help people get out, be able to exercise and experience, you know, the public places free of traffic. Well, when the pandemic hit in 2020, the usage actually went up 40%. So that truly was like a field of dreams because it was built and they did come and people are still using those trails today. I love Newcastle because of the people who are here. We know each other personally because, you know, we're about 18,000 people, but the people here either grew up here or a lot of them left but came back when they got children because they really like it, that we have good schools, that we're a safe community, and that uh, nobody meets a stranger. If you need help, 
it's going to happen here in Newcastle. So government works together, uh, nonprofits work together. We all try to work together to make a great community. And I just can't say enough about the great people who live here and make it that way. I got drafted in the Army in the late 60s, and you had to go through all your training, and then you had to go serve a year's tour. And when they got back home, they still had six months I had to serve. And I thought, I don't want to do that. If I ever get home, nobody's going to make me leave again. So I made a deal with the Army, and they uh, said, well, if you'll extend your tour and stay for a little while, when you get home, we'll set you free, and you don't ever have to do anything. And I said, I'll take it. 1995 or a little after that I just started saving things that I saw that said Newcastle on them. I would go out uh, and hit all the little trash and treasure shops, antique stores and anything I would find that said Newcastle on it, I was buying it. And it just got to the point where I've got lots of stuff now, <laughs> a whole lots of stuff. Well, first of all, I've got uh, quite a few pieces that I've bought from my local artist friends here in town. And then I've got the little treasure things that mean a lot to me from pins and buttons from factories and uh, little things like that. And I've got also a lot of uh, high school memorabilia. I went through uh, the Indiana room upstairs reading all the Newcastle papers. And I've probably seen pretty close to every Newcastle paper ever printed here in town. And I had everything organized on three by five cards and it got to, I had so much that I thought surely somebody else will like this. So I started putting my first book together about 2007. Then after that, I started doing one book a year and up, uh, I had all six or seven books and but I sold quite a few of them and, and I got a chance uh, to meet everybody that bought a book, I would hand deliver it to them. Everybody else gets with their friends on Facebook and they chat about the kids. So I started putting some of these vintage Newcastle pictures up. And especially, I did them mostly for my friends who uh, moved out of town that were from here. And it got to the point where they were sending me messages back and saying things, oh, I remember this so well. Or we went here at a dance one time, stuff like that, you know. And that just fascinated me that they had their own little stories to tell. And that pumped me up and I just kept giving them more and more and more. I love Newcastle because I was born here. It took me a while to learn how to appreciate it. And uh, I just wish that everybody could have that feeling. And I, now a lot of my friends, especially as they, get, as they get older, they feel the same way. I wouldn't live anywhere else. This is too easy. This is my heaven. We were asked to meet with the uh, then mayor uh, who wanted us to create a task force on poverty. Three months later, we became a nonprofit and gave ourselves a name, uh, not Task Force, but Hope Initiative. And we um, had the audacious vision that we should ensure dignity for every citizen. We had volunteers and we built four raised garden beds and allow these uh, some citizens to produce their own produce and flowers so for the satisfaction of being able to, to do that, you know, to have their own uh, project that they can uh, feel good about uh, right there in their own neighborhood. The uh, council and the mayor asked us to do a, uh, some focus groups and we did and we asked people, we had over 250 people participate, what do you love about living in Newcastle? And boy did they have things they loved. The second question is what caused us to mobilize? What would make it even better? It said you need a stellar early learning. 
Um, it talked about how we needed to clean up our community. Clean it up, I mean simply <laughs> get rid of the trash. That second question that said what would make us better, people were so thoughtful and so truthful and thank goodness leadership was willing to listen and so over the last, um, last eight, nine years we've just watched as uh, uh, and participated in solving those, those problems. I wouldn't tell you we've solved them all, but we're certainly addressing them. We have not found a problem that doesn't demand partnerships. It doesn't demand collaboration. There are little pockets of organizations, churches, individuals, that were trying to give similar uh, school supplies, uh, so they could have the proper school supplies going into the new year of school. So what Hope tried to do, and, and I think was very successful, was gather all those organizations as one big event on one day. Two years ago, there was a little over 800 backpacks given away with school supplies. That, the backpacks are in the morning, festivals in the afternoon where children and family members can come and just have a great time celebrating the fact that they're getting ready to go back to school. We also have uh, hairdressers throughout the town bring their own equipment, their own supplies, and they provide free haircuts to children who, who would want them. And like, uh, that's my favorite event the whole day. I can stand there and watch these little kids come in first time maybe for a professional haircut and they're so excited. It's just a way to let them know that school is so important to them and that the schools themselves are eager and are really wanting them to be there. What's more important than children in a community? My dad, Samuel Buchanan, he was a fruit picker. And one day, Roe Beasley, who was his boss, asked him if he would uh, take a interstate route to Mount Summit, Indiana. And after about two years taking that route to Mount Summit, Indiana, my dad decided to move to Newcastle, Indiana, which changed the whole dynamics of our life. Because in Florida, we weren't allowed to go to restaurants. <laughs> We didn't have pizza, or cookies. The things that happened here in Indiana was not heard of for us in Florida. We were migrant workers, and um, when the migrant workers uh, came to town to Newcastle, they were treated just a little different. But my dad was very persistent when it came to kindness and compassion. He was very kind-hearted, had a huge heart, would always speak to everyone, and just began to start to make friends. Then he was offered a job at Goodwin Dodge, shoveling snow off cars. And he took that job and we moved to a house inside of Newcastle. And our life began. He decided to take a job driving the bus, which from what I understand, he was the first African-American bus driver in Henry County. So that bus job became his ministry, and it was a ministry of choosing to love. And he gained an incredible fanfare here in Henry County. If someone treated him bad, Dad would just say, we've got to choose to love. So his kindness was like contagious here in Henry County. On one occasion, he was driving the bus, and a gentleman got on the bus, and he slapped him. My brother, David, was on the bus, and David really wanted to go after him, and my dad asked him not to, but he chose to love him. And what I did find out later on is that that same man that slapped him came back and apologized, and they ended up becoming friends. He was a member of the NAACP. Shortly after we first moved here, they had applied for a home, and um, they had saved their money for a down payment, but they were not able to get that home in that community, and the bank wanted to loan him money in another community. 
And um, my dad had me sit down and write a letter to NAACP. Next thing I know, I'm coming from school and there is someone from the NAACP in our home that had come from Chicago. They got the house they wanted. When we moved here, my dad was like, okay, we're in the North, so we're gonna do some things that we haven't been able to do. So what he did, he started marching us up into churches, probably that had not seen black people in their church. And here was this family of seven children. Most of the time, someone would ask him to come up because he was a preacher. And boy, when they would give him the floor, he would say, I've got seven musicians. And then he'd call us all up to sing, of course. And he did that for years and years. And finally, he gave us a group name, and it's called Buchanan Unity. And even to this day, we still perform music and we do praise and worship wherever the Spirit of the Lord sends us. And mostly, it's, it is in white churches here in this county. I would like to say thank you to Newcastle from the bottom of my heart. It has given us a chance to grow racially. It has given us a chance to embrace our community, embrace hope, embrace faith. I love Newcastle because it has brought hope to our family. And in essence, that hope will spill out into the world. I wanted more of that music, didn't you, Margaret? I felt like just when I was getting going. the groove on. Yes. <laughs> we saw, what a powerful Absolutely. story. Absolutely. We've got to choose to love. I am never going to forget that. And I'm going to guess you watching tonight, you are not going to forget that story or the other amazing stories that you've seen this evening on Now Entering Newcastle. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. I'm Michelle Kinsey along with Margaret Reeder, and we are coming to you from the Ball State PBS studios on the campus of Ball State University. It's been great celebrating the stories of Newcastle with all of you tonight. We cannot thank the people of Newcastle enough for participating in this series. It's the stories of your friends and neighbors coming to life on the screen. And behind us is our phone Yay, bank. We have some of your bank. friends and neighbors. The residents and storytellers from Newcastle taking your calls of support. Keep them coming. Yes. We want to take a minute now and thank those of you who have called in. Absolutely. Well, you I think you have the calls and I've got some Facebook friends. Okay, chat about. So yes. Barbara and Larry Langford, we think of Newcastle yep. as the best place to raise children. We've visited lots of places and we think Newcastle is the best place. We Here, have heard that a that's lot a theme. tonight. That's a theme the we're hearing theme. tonight. Yes. Marilyn Witt says, I support Newcastle in all their current endeavors and I think it's on the way to becoming an even better city. I'm an artist and the Art Association of Henry County has been such a blessing. Wonderful. Tom, I love this one. You're going to love this one. Thomas and Ann Brown, yeah. who are in Lafayette, Indiana, mm -hmm. called in because Paul Brown, their son, who is behind the camera tonight, one of the producers on the show, your parents are very proud of the that work you do, adorable. Paul. And you deserve that, yes. all the work you put into this. Yeah, you know, Ta yeah. <laughs> Paul says, thanks, Mom thanks, and Dad. Thanks, Mom and Dad. And well, thank you for letting it, us know. A hand for the entire Now Entering Newcastle crew. Absolutely. They have done an amazing job. They continue to do such amazing work on this project. Every time we do a new Now Entering, I think, mm -hmm. oh, how can we top the last one? And, and the team here at Ball State PBS really just they're amazing yep absolutely it's kind of a big deal kind uh, of a are, big deal yep, they are a keep big deal. posting your comments use that hashtag NE Newcastle we love hearing from you and if you have friends or family who can't watch the show on TV we can stream it live on ballstatepbs.org or Facebook we're here tonight sharing the stories of Newcastle that only can be told on your 
local PBS station, Ball State PBS, help support this station and this work that brings you such powerful local storytelling by making a contribution right now. We make it easy for you. You choose the amount, you choose the thank you gift, and you choose how you'd like to pay. Don't put off making that call. 1-800-252-9472. Now is the time to show your love and support for your hometown, Newcastle, and our, your local PBS station. Ball State PBS takes pride in serving Newcastle and all of East Central Indiana every day with programs you love. And your financial support, no matter the amount, really does make a difference. 1-800-252-9472. Here at Ball State PBS, we always aim to reflect the values and viewing preferences of the communities we serve. Ball State PBS is locally owned and operated, and programming decisions are made right here by people who understand the unique character of our viewing community. And that's part of what makes public television special. But it also takes your support to keep it that way. And the easiest way to support Ball State PBS is to become a sustaining member. If you've never heard of a sustaining membership before, let me tell you how easy it is and how it works. Instead of giving one lump sum of $60 or $120 each year, you can spread out your support to a much more manageable $5 or $10 a month. And the best part of becoming a sustaining member is that you'll never have to think about whether or not it's time to renew your support of the programs you love. Your monthly contributions will automatically come out of your bank account or credit card, so your membership will always be current. There isn't an easier or more popular way to do your part to keep your favorite shows, like now entering, on the air. It takes just a couple of minutes to set up, and it's easy to sign up online or by phone. 800-252-9472 is the number to call, or you can go online at ballstatepbs.org. And when you call in with your annual gift of $60 or a sustaining gift of $5 a month, we'll send you the now entering Newcastle DVD as a thank you. Or if you can give a little more with an annual gift of $108 or a sustaining gift of $9 a month, we'll send you two DVDs as a thank you gift one for you and one for a friend. There's bonus material on the DVD that you won't see on tonight's broadcast, including a look behind the scenes of production day at the Newcastle Library and from the Ball State PBS studios, as well as photos, interviews, and so much more. All you have to do is call us and talk to one of the volunteers, 800-252-9472, or go online to ballstatepbs.org. And with your contribution, you can take advantage of a special member benefit called Passport. Passport brings you thousands of hours of great PBS and local programs whenever you want on the PBS app, your streaming device, phone, or tablet. You can catch up on shows that you may have missed or revisit some of your favorites. And the best part is you can watch whenever you want. Isn't that right, Margaret? That's right. We've talked to a couple storytellers tonight, and I think we have one more over there for Michelle to interview and tell us a little bit more in depth about the stories behind now entering Newcastle. We still want to hear from you. Give us a call, 800-252-9472, or visit us online at ballstatepbs.org. And we can't wait to hear from you, and we can't wait to hear more of these stories. Back to you, Michelle. Thanks, Margaret. I'm here with Sophine, and we heard her story in the last segment of Now Entering Newcastle. Sophine, I have to tell you that, first of all, it was such a touching and, and wonderful story. So first and foremost, thank you so much for sharing. And secondly, I loved the photos and the videos. And I hear a little bird told me that you may hold the record for submitting the most photos because you had so many photos in yes. your collection to share. Uh, tell me a little bit about uh, looking through those. Tell me about the process of going back and, and finding the photos that you thought told the story best. Wow. Um, just going back there made me remember when we first came to Newcastle and it, it seemed so huge, you know, when we rode through the city. Yeah. 
it just, we were like, the buildings are so big. <laughs> and so it took me back to when we were living at the migrant camp. Yes. You know, we, um, we lived in a trailer and it was just a half trailer. Mm -hmm. And it was our whole family. Wow. And then That's it, seven kids. Yes, right? seven yeah. yes. Six kids because we have one that was born in Indiana, Lucinda. Oh gotcha. Yes. Okay. Yes. And so it took me back to coming here, living at a migrant camp, and then moving to Newcastle, going to school in Newcastle, yeah. meeting people that we had no association with in Florida, sure. which were white people, you know, sure. and um, learning that they could be so friendly, you know, they brought food over for us when we moved there, mm -hmm. clothing, um, cookies, um, people were baking cookies. Wow. <laughs> you know, That's so. That's quite a welcome. That yeah. was, you know, mm -hmm. and um, it just reminded me that we lived in a very segregated community in Florida. Mm -hmm. And when we got here, like my dad said, you know, we're free now. We're going to do some things that we couldn't do. And he was always an activist of love. And I love that. Yes. Can you, can you share yes. a little bit about, had he, had he always been that way? And then I'm assuming he instilled that in all of his children yes. and everybody he came across. Talk a little bit about I mean, he just seemed like such a loving soul. Yes, yes. Our dad was someone who was, just gave a lot of grace, a lot of love, a lot of compassion. Even when we were growing up, you know, I thought about how he would uh, wake us up in the morning. He would just knock on the door. We never, I never heard him yell oh my or use profanity. You know, he was just a kind man. He always wanted to have a solution to whatever problem that we had. I can remember him um, sitting on the back steps when I was a little girl and just reading to me. Oh, wow. Yes, you know, he was just a very generous and kind man. He loved humanity. I mean, he, he, he loved people. Yeah. yeah. And that's a story in and of itself. Mm -hmm. But then there's the whole really cool family band thing. Oh, yeah. Well, how great is that? I can I can just <laughs> imagine what it was like rehearsing at home. Did you rehearse? At, oh, was yeah. it in the garage? Was it in the living room? I mean, where did you have all of your stuff set up and how often did you play? Did you play a lot? Almost, yeah, weekly, sometimes yeah. daily. Yes, yeah. yes. Um, we started, my dad was a guitarist. He played the guitar. And then as we grew up, he would we would all start singing. Yeah. You know, we, <laughs> did you say, kind of want in your on turn. it? Did you think it was really cool that he did that? And you're it, like, oh, I want to sing with it that. It was, yeah. and the first song that he taught me, and I can remember it. It was, yes, Jesus loves me, oh, and he play he would play that on the guitar, and I would sing it. Yeah. But as we got older, all as you know, all of us began to sing, and he named the group Buchanan Unity. Yeah you know, because we were a family, and he would always say that he had seven musicians, you know, he had Daniel who played the keyboard, yes. Sam who played the bass, David who played the drums, wow. and these were natural gifts. My sister Queenie and I, Lucinda and Dietrich, we did the singing. I love that. Yes. I love that so much. Yes. Uh, now, a lot of, we have a lot of storytellers featured yes. this evening. Yes. There are a lot more people in Newcastle, people that didn't Tell stories yes. uh, this evening. Why was it important for you to tell a story? It was so important because um, our dad had such a legacy there in Newcastle. Um, the way he treated people, being the first African American to drive the bus, mm -hmm. when he when people got on his bus, it was an experience. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling you, people talk about him right now. Yeah. People will say things to me like, you know, I got on the bus one day with your dad and I was feeling down. And by the time I got off, you know, I was feeling so much better or I had hope. Yeah. You know, he, he just. It's a beautiful legacy. It's a wonderful legacy. Yes, and, yes. and now it's one that you've shared yes. with so many other people. Thank yes. you so much again you. for sharing your story this evening. We're going to send it back to Margaret. Thanks, Michelle. More great stories. 
more wonderful community history and living history. And it's so great that you're here with us sharing in all of these stories. We still want to hear from you. 800-252-9472 or ballstatepbs.org. You can also watch the show on Facebook Live and send us a message with um, hashtag NE Newcastle. Thanks to everyone who's called in. And I know uh, online, Michelle, you've got, yes, we've you've got, got some folks to. We have got a lot of people watching on Facebook. And as they're watching, they're making comments about the videos. They're talking about, you know, their connection with Newcastle. And I just wanted to read this one that we got from Victoria Knack. It says, hi from California. I grew up in Newcastle, and until last December, my mom, Helen Fuller, still lived there until she passed a few days before her 98th birthday. Wow. What always amazes me is the number of wonderful people who grew up in Newcastle and became very successful in their careers all over the U.S. For a town that's so small, their impact is so great. It's such a wonderful community. And she ended with a little heart. Oh, I How love that heart that? emoji. I love that. We also want to thank some sponsors tonight. Yes. Our premium sponsors, Reach Networks and Henry County Community Foundation. So thank you to all of the sponsors. And um, we'd like to thank Reach Networks, Henry County Community Foundation, and all of the members who have called in, renewed support, or become new members to support this programming that you rely on here at Ball State PBS. Reach Networks provides businesses with information technology, from voice over phone service, managed IT and remote computer backup, to enterprise software and hardware. Its retail location is at Computer & Company in Newcastle. More information is at reach-networks.com. Since 1985, donors have been using the Henry County Community Foundation to make their giving effective through grants and scholarships to benefit local residents and improve lives in Henry County. The Henry County Community Foundation is honored to partner with caring individuals to make Henry County a great place to call home. Yep, as Margaret said just a few moments ago, thanks so much to the support of sponsors like Reach Networks and Henry County Community Foundation and Ball State PBS viewers like you. Because of that, we can continue to bring a world of information, education, entertainment, and wonder into your home. Make that call now, 800-252-9472, or go online at ballstatepbs.com. Org. And with an annual gift of $60 or a sustaining gift of $5 a month, you'll receive your very own copy of the DVD now entering Newcastle as a thank you. Or for an annual gift of $108 or $9 a month, you'll receive two DVDs. And now, back to the program you got and it. more great stories. Absolutely. I'm uh, Neil Thornhill. I'm a lifelong resident of Newcastle, Indiana, and I'm here to talk about uh, the history of Newcastle High School basketball. I had read an article in the paper about a school in southern Indiana honoring one of their really good teams from 25 years before. And I thought, you know, that's kind of neat that they did that. Uh, I wonder if we could do that. Our athletic director at the time was very enthusiastic about it. He said, go with it, go run with it. Uh, we had a great turnout that first year. All the players came back. It's just gone since then. Uh, we've honored good teams, bad teams, average teams, uh, good players, average players, bad players. We don't care. We just want the, all the seniors to come back and we honor them and they just have a wonderful time. So over 80% of the guys have come back uh, each year that we've honored. I think people have seen how supportive and how big a hit Silver Anniversary Night has been over the years. And so our athletic director, a different athletic director than was the one that started the Silver Anniversary Night, he decided, he got a group of us together, about a half a dozen of us together, and said, let's, uh, let's try to plan on honoring 100 years of Newcastle basketball. And uh, also, let's put together a all-century Newcastle high school basketball team. Well, I just, I jumped at that. I just, it didn't take me but a millisecond to say, yeah, I'm all in on that. 
we thought uh, all century team let's have a ballot of 100 players and let the fans choose who they think should be the all century team because we felt like newcastle fans were pretty knowledgeable and they could do that they could handle that and they did uh, there were over 16,000 votes cast for the newcastle basketball uh, all century team which is incredible that's just incredible this is one of my most prized possessions. Uh, this basketball is the, uh, it's got the names of all of the uh, members of that all century team that the fans chose. Uh, two obvious names that stand out is uh, Kent Benson, our Mr. Basketball, who went on to win a national championship with Indiana, and Steve Alford, uh, who was our Mr. Basketball from 1983 and went on to win a national championship at Indiana in 1987. In, going back in the past, of course, uh, Ray Pavey played at Indiana, was a great player. Butch Joyner was a great player uh, that played here. Those are, those are just names, all, Indiana All-Stars. Uh, Rodney Haynes was an Indiana All-Star back in the 80s. More recently, uh, Mason Gillis, of course, uh, who's at uh, Purdue now. Luke Bumbelow's at Ball State now. We've had no shortage of great players. We've had 20 coaches. We've had Orville Hooker, probably one of the early great coaches that we've had. Cecil Tagg uh, in the 60s and 70s went to the state finals two years. Steve Bennett won the state championship while he was here. He just recently retired. Sam Alford, of course, was here 20 years. Uh, you just go down the list. We haven't, we've had a lot of great coaches. I played for a couple years, played for a great coach, Cecil Tagg. So I uh, can't blame the coach. We just weren't very good. But uh, uh, I did play, and uh, that was a big part of my life, too. And uh, I'll always be happy about that. There were all kinds of bits and pieces of Newcastle basketball history uh, floating around, but it had never been compiled into one, one central book. And so that's what I've been working on over the last 40 plus years, is uh, collecting bits and pieces of Newcastle basketball history and putting it together. It's been a huge part of Newcastle uh, as long as I've been around, and it's been a big deal for a long, long time, long before I got here, and I'm sure it'll be a big deal long after I leave. Henry County Memorial Park was established on June 11th of 1920, so as of this year, we are 101 years old. It was formed out of the money that was left in the war chest here in Henry County. And a group of gentlemen got together, Mr. Shively was uh, in charge, and they purchased some property and started Henry County Memorial Park including the historical part. We have about 368 acres. We have all types of amenities there. Uh, we have rental buildings, rental shelters. To the west of us, we have a beautiful 18-hole golf course. It's Henry County Memorial Golf Course. We also have the Expo Center. The Expo Center is in the process of construction right now. The building they're working on, if you go out that way, is the banquet room, the banquet hall. It uh, has offices for Purdue Extension and 4-H. Uh, the biggest thing that we do have over there is the Henry County Saddle Club. And the Saddle Club has some of the largest shows uh, in the United States over there. We are the largest living memorial in the state of Indiana. The first memorial that came to Henry County Memorial Park was the Wilbur Wright Memorial. Uh, it was put in in 1923 to honor Wilbur Wright and the aviation. From there, we went to the Doughboy, which is one of the most sacred in the park. Uh, the Doughboy originally stood on the northeast part of the property. Uh, Doughboy was from World War I and he represented the boys that fought in World War I from the counties that were basically on the front line. Uh, one of the next ones that we had was, uh, we've got the Bundy Memorial, and Bundy was a general from here, Omar Bundy, and we have two cannons that his men actually captured under his watch and brought back. We have uh, our, what we fondly call our Big Four Memorial. That honors World War I to the Korean War and Vietnam. And that is the memorial you will see from State Road 3. The memorial that we're working on right now is called the Global War on Terror. 
and that is to honor everything from September 11, 2001 and continuing up till today. This is the only memorial that will be put in before the war has ended. All the rest of them were 10 years or more after. We have uh, a lot of veterans that come out and visit the memorials and they like the solitude so they tend to come more in the evening time. We see people in their three-piece suits having lunch there every day. We see a lot of families come out there. We have fishing. We see a lot of people bring their families out to fish. But there's people from all over the state that come here. And now that we've been put on the national and the state historic registry, we'll have more access uh, to uh, advertisement. People will know where we're at, what we have, and we'll look to see people from far away come in. My favorite thing is to feed the ducks. They meet me no matter what I'm driving. They know it's me. Uh, they're waiting on their feed and they'll come quacking at me before I ever get out of the vehicle. So they're my favorite thing and I love to sit on the hills and watch the people with their families. It's, uh, it's a nice, quiet, peaceful place, but yet you can watch people uh, have a good time and that makes me feel good. Henry County Kiwanis Club and the Henry County Newcastle Kiwanis Club They've been known for years for giving out shoes, and basically that started with a very small project in the schools. The, the nurses and administrators had vouchers that they would give to children that needed shoes. Sometimes the kids were given the vouchers, but for whatever various reasons, they didn't show back up at school with the shoes. And so we decided that if we couldn't get the kids to the shoe store, that we wanted to be able to take the shoes to the kids. And so we partnered with um, the local shoe stores and we came up with kind of like the, the new and improved shoe program. So that basically means that we go out to each individual elementary school, um, the shoe store comes, we get a list from the school of who is eligible and who needs new shoes. The shoe store uh, measure the kids' feet so that they know what size they need. And then a, two to three days later, maybe a week later, we come back with the shoe store and boxes and boxes of shoes and we go into cafeterias, libraries, gyms, wherever's appropriate. And we basically set up a shoe store. And so that afternoon, the kids come in one at a time and we know what size they are. We walk them over to that size and they get to pick out their own, their own shoes. And so we help them put them on. We tie them a lot of times for them. And, and we give them new socks as well, because if you get new shoes, you need new socks. So they all leave that day with new socks and shoes. So a lot of them can jump higher and run faster and uh, big, big smiles most times, pretty big smiles. Um, we did open it up. It's not just for Newcastle now, it's for all elementary schools in Henry County. So um, we, we broaden that program. Used to, we paid for the shoes just out of our, our normal funds. And so we were doing a lot of fundraising. It, it seemed like every time we turned around, we were selling tickets to something to raise money for this shoe program. And there was an evening that a friend of mine and I were sitting, and we were just trying to brainstorm about how could we continuously raise money for this program and didn't have to sell something. And so we came up with the Kiwana Century Club. And we thought if we could get 100 people to donate $100 every year on a repeated basis and we just sent an invoice and they just paid it, that would raise the $10,000 a year that we needed for those shoes and that's what we did and it took off and everybody in the Kiwanis just started contacting the people that they knew in their networks and circles and so for the past three years or so we've had the, the Kiwanis Century Club and um, that's how we pay for our shoes now. Because it's really blown up into this huge program, we will now get calls sometimes, you know, we've had um, a high school marching band member um, that we got contacted and they needed shoes, and so we bought their shoes. We've had youth football program call us to say, hey, we've got a couple kids that need football cleats, and so we'll buy those. Um, so really, we have become the shoe people in, in Newcastle. Volunteerism, I think, kind of grabs a hold of you and, and turns into part of who you are. When you are, are gifted with great rewards and, and great talent in your life, it also comes with great expectation and that's to give back. And so I just really feel like I've been blessed in my life with my kids and my career and my family. And um, 
it's part of my responsibility to give back to maybe those that aren't quite as blessed. There's a rich tradition at Newcastle. It started out as we had jazz choirs, and once upon a time, a few years ago, the principal came to us and he said, you know, the North Central Conference next year is going to decide to have more competitions besides sports. We decided that year it was a jazz choir, but then we decided, okay, we'll make it into a show car. We went to um, Ben Davis, and we did real well. And son of a gun, we even uh, qualified for the state finals that year. And that year, it was all the schools in the whole state. But now since then, it's become classes. And uh, we still, we do really, really well. From 2008 to 2012, we in fact had two show choirs. We had a girls show choir and we had a mixed. The mixed choir did well, but then in 2012, we won, we were the state champions. So it's, it's a very competitive and the kids love it, the parents chip in, everybody, the town uh, just backs us to no end when it comes to that part of the program. Of course, that's fun. Well, what made Mrs. Hubbard uh, special to me wasn't just her Indiana Teacher of the Year Award, which she does have um, and doesn't talk about, but uh, um, no, what really made her special is how she made the choir department feel like a family, um, and I needed that at that point in my life. Uh, um, that was really why I even moved over to the choir department to spend all of my time in choir and music theater because um, it felt like family to me, and it was an environment that was safe and friendly and fun and that I could pour myself into, and we were always doing things. I was in the very first um, Newcastle Show Choir in 2005. We went to state for that, so I mean, it was and continues to be a way for a teenager to be accepted, loved, and stay busy, which is so important. Mr. Hurst was in my choir when he was in high school, and in fact, his wife was too. They dated and now they're married. He went off to school to Upland at Taylor University, came back, student taught with us. Then he went to Milan, and he spread his wings to become a young teacher on his own. After four years of being in Milan, I got a call and I came back home to Newcastle as the assistant director, where after a few years, um, I became head director He's a technological wizard, so he's had to teach me, and then I've taught him some of the old-fashioned ways, and we put it all together, and we still have a very, very strong program. At a larger school, you can divide and conquer. You can send some students over here to be, you're the show choir kids, and you can send other students over here, and you're the concert choir kids. We don't have that. Our same students that perform expertly in show choir and put in those hours are also meeting after school other days to do jazz music and are the same students who, um, for our winter concert, perform major works like Vivaldi's Gloria. They're the same kids. We're with them so many hours and after school on weekends we go to contests. So we're teaching life skills, we're teaching disciplines, we're teaching them to be organized, organizing their time. So we hope by the time they're done, it's not just music they've learned, they've learned life through their music. It's wonderful to, to have my choir director, Mrs. Hubbard, who was my choir director when I was a youth, still with us to, to work with us, to play piano, to give advice. And now I have an assistant director who is young, who I was able to give much of that same advice back to. She gave it to me, I'm giving it to my assistant director who is now soaring and doing amazing things as well. Her name is Alyssa Potisha. Um, and so we have, just in the three of us, almost like a multi-generational um, movement of teaching and information and, and love for students and for vocal music. I know there's a lot of teachers that don't want to do this after they retire. I don't know. It's just a passion. Maybe you might say I'm crazy, but I love being with those kids and doing this.
I love Newcastle choirs and I love Newcastle because of the dedication of the people, the team element, and the family um, that music has created for me and that I get to help create with and for other students. I'd always been interested in public service. I was very active in high school. Um, one of the first campaign I ever worked was um, Harold Griffin, who's now one of my council colleagues. I helped campaign for him. Um, when I went to Ball State, I was really involved on campus uh, in university governance. I was in university senate for four years. I was student body president. That was pretty cool. Um, so I've always, always, always been interested in public service. And I think five years ago, I started feeling like I need to get home and get involved. And that's the only place I want to be involved is back in Henry County. When I'm in government meetings, I am almost always the youngest person in the room by about a decade or more. Um, and I think we're kind of unusual too because we have three council members who are in their 40s and that's they're youthful as well, but I'm sort of the extreme. Um, and on our city council, uh, I wanted to mention Aaron Dickin. Um, he is also 35 years old. He's a Democrat, I'm a Republican, but Aaron is a great member of our community and I've really enjoyed collaborating with him on a variety of projects. Ever since I can remember, and people have told me from a very young age uh, that they could see me as mayor. I think in high school I was voted most likely to stay in Newcastle. And when my wife and I married in 2011, we decided that we wanted to raise our family here, but we wanted to be involved to make it a community where everybody wanted to live and would feel proud to call home. I think at the local level, we work really well together. I think we all understand, we're all in this together, we're all neighbors. You know, I'm not gonna hate somebody because they're in a different party. And so finding that middle ground, working towards solutions, I think a lot of us share that conviction in Henry County and it's, I hope, I hope our citizens see that, that we are all interested in, in that progress. You meet people that have the same type of energy and the same common goal, uh, which is, I, I think, describes my relationship with Betsy. She makes me want to strive to be a better representative for our community. The paths that we might get to that goal might look a little different, but uh, that common goal is the end point for us both. You know, when I was growing up, the far edge of Indianapolis was pretty much you know, 465. Now it's Greenfield on, on 70. So, you know, what are the next exits down the way? It's, it's Henry County, it's Knightstown, it's, you know, Spiceland and Newcastle, it's New Lisbon, we're next. And so I'm really excited to see that economic growth, home building, all of it, jobs come to this county. It's important for young people to get involved in government because I think far too often we uh, lead by reaction instead of uh, being proactive. I think that uh, young people have a, an energy and a, a passion to create a long lasting home. And there's a lot of different paths to getting involved, but we need young people in public service. We need ideas. We need people thinking about the future. I would say get involved in your local parties, you know, reach out to local elected officials. Don't be afraid to reach out to people. I, there are so many people, people like me, who would love to steer you in the right direction. I always try to challenge people, look, get involved, whether it is, you know, running someone's campaign, getting on city council or county council, um, or just showing up to meetings and voicing your concerns and organizing a group of people with a common goal, that's just as important as sitting in one of those seats on the other side of the table. I love Newcastle because it has an incredible history. And you know we have a great basketball legacy with the Field House, the Hall of Fame. But I think what I like most about Newcastle are the people. We have really good people here. Families that have been here for a couple hundred years at this point. So I, I, th I think my answer is the people. Everyone has a story to tell, and we have heard some great ones this evening, especially in that last segment. Thanks for joining us for now entering Newcastle tonight on Ball State PBS. I'm Michelle Kinsey along with Margaret Reeder, and we're so happy you could join us to celebrate all the stories from Newcastle. Thanks to the people and the town of Newcastle for participating in this series. There was certainly no 
shortage of stories in Newcastle. We've enjoyed such a variety this evening, and you can enjoy the stories anytime with your own copy of tonight's program. When you call in with an annual gift of $60 or a sustaining gift of $5 a month, you'll receive Now Entering Newcastle on DVD. Or if you can give a little bit more, with an annual gift of $108 or a sustaining gift of $9 a month, we'll send you two DVDs, which includes additional material that you won't see on tonight's broadcast, including a look behind the scenes, footage from the Ball State PBS studios, photos, and more. And all you have to do is give us a call, 800-252-9472, or go online at ballstatepbs.org. We want to take a moment to thank all of our sponsors one more time who helped make this broadcast possible. Thanks to our presenting sponsors, Reach Network, Henry County Community Foundation, Citizens State Bank, the City of Newcastle, Henry County Destination Development, Henry County Health, and Henry County REMC. And thanks to our community sponsor, Doug Meyer State Farm, ERA, Integrity Real Estate, Hinsey Brown Funeral Services, Indiana Basketball Hall of Fame, Jack's Donuts, McGowan Insurance, and the Newcastle Henry County Chamber of Commerce. A big thanks for your support. Now, let's see who we've heard from tonight as well. And thank, we'll thank some of those folks who are calling in right now on our next break. But thanks to all of you who've called in and shared supporting, telling us your stories, your experience. And this is the kind of program that you can only find on Ball State PBS through the now entering program. I believe Michelle has another story for one of our storytellers and she's here to talk with us a little bit more about their experience. Michelle? Thank you so much, Margaret. With me is Neil Thornhill. Neil, refresh everybody's memory. What story did you I talked about tell. Newcastle basketball well, and uh, new, the history did. of Newcastle basketball. Uh, get my two cents worth in. <laughs> you kind of live and breathe it, don't you? A little you? bit, a little yeah. bit, a little bit. Yeah, we do. Talk we do. a little bit about your history with Newcastle well, basketball. Uh, oh, several years ago, uh, I got involved with starting uh, tr trying to compile all the history of uh, the, st the statistical history of Newcastle basketball. And it's one of those things where you, you're never really finished with that. You know, right. that's always, there's always something to, I always tell people there's always a list to make or a story to tell. <laughs> and that, it just never ends. Sure. And so it, you know, after you get it, you up, up, after you update it one year, then the next year you can update it and somebody asks you a question about something. And, and so uh, I've been very much involved in that over the years. And then uh, I was uh, asked to be involved in celebrating 100 years of Newcastle basketball. Yeah. And uh, we actually uh, did a lot of things celebrating that and actually uh, selected an all-century team uh, from 100 years, which is, uh, uh, we let the fans decide that, and uh, there were actually, in a town of 18,000 people, there were 16,000 votes cast. So that oh, kind of well, tells I you a little bit of how this. serious people take, uh, take their, take like their basketball. Ba take their basketball. <laughs> and then another thing that we've done uh, is honored uh, the 25-year uh, anniversary of the senior members of the team from 25 years before. Wow. So, you know, you're going to run into situations where you're not always going to be uh, gangbusters every year. You know, you're going to honor teams that sure. maybe aren't quite as good, but we still do that. Absolutely. And we still honor those teams uh, because we make them, we, we feel like they're, they, they're, a, they're, they're a brick in the foundation that have made Newcastle basketball what it is. And uh, we've been doing that for now 37 years, wow. uh, the 20, honoring the 25th anniversary team. And uh, over that 37-year period, we've had uh, we've honored over 150 seniors, uh, and over 80% of them have come back. So uh, that's, that's uh, so, and that's uh, that's that's what makes it. Uh, that's the thing that shows how how new people feel about Newcastle basketball Absolutely. and the former players. Uh, we had a player one time that we honored. He was a he was an athlete. He'd become an athletic director yeah. at a high school here in Indiana. And he was trying to do that. He was trying to start uh, a silver anniversary program. Yeah. And he said, you know, the, the, the school where he was, they, they had great teams, great coaches, great players, won state championships. And he said, I just can't get it off the ground. He said, I can't get it off the ground. I just don't, the people don't have the interest. And he said something that I'll never forget. He said, they don't feel it here like we feel it here. And that, 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 that sums it up. That Absolutely. sums it up. You know, 
you you uh, they just they just want to come back and uh, and uh, they always 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 enjoy coming back and so that's uh, those are the kinds of things that I've been involved in and uh, it's just been it's just been a, I've really enjoyed it yeah I've really enjoyed it. We can't thank you enough for coming to tell your story as part of now entering Newcastle. Sure. What did you think of the whole? process like well, I coming just told in one of your guys here uh, you know it's just incredible to me not knowing anything about television production yeah or anything how you do something like sure. this it's just incredible to me how you take 15 or 20 stories from 15 or draw 15 or 20 different people and pull it all together and make it just flow and 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 you just make it work and that's that's just terrifically impressive to me yeah uh, because it's just uh, it was uh, it just it's just fun to be a part of it and you see the final product you Absolutely. know and see what a great job you, you guys didn't have realize done. you were a filmmaker well, I, 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 yeah. you know you make us all look pretty good uh, the only complaint I have is about 30 degrees in here and I'm freezing to death. <laughs> That's the only complaint I've got. Well, you're making people feel all warm and fuzzy <laughs> oh, at home, so there, it's a trade-off. Except for that, it's yeah. been terrific. <laughs> <laughs> Why, uh, what do you hope people are getting out of this as well, they're watching from home? I think you're just like you've, we've had phone calls from people from all over the country today, tonight, yes. you know. And uh, just, you know, small towns have so much to offer. You know, they just have so much to offer. And you can, you know, my wife and I, we take walks every day to walk our little dog and we can walk around our community and feel completely safe. Yeah. And, you know, not worry about uh, uh, about anything happening, you know. Uh, our kids, uh, you know, our kids uh, live, have grown up and live there. And, and uh, it's just, uh, Newcastle's a wonderful place to live, to raise a family. And, and basketball is a big part of it, but there's lots of other things clearly that uh, that people have seen tonight on the on the on the program. Absolutely, it's not just basketball. Absolutely, uh, it, it may be my first choice, but it's not it's not just <laughs> basketball. So, uh, it's just been a lot of fun. That's wonderful. Yeah. I know I know this is going to be shocking, Neil, mm -hmm. but there are still people at home right now that have not made the call. Yeah. They've not gone online right. to support this program right. and to support you know other now right. enterings right. to come in the future and get you know their thank you gifts for the debate what what would you like to say to well them i think uh, you know just like just like you, you you were telling us uh, i don't know if it was on the air or not but you were telling us that this this tonight helps fund the next entering town right. and so it's not only important that you know you, you the newcastle folks uh, show their pride in newcastle but it also helps the next the next program and so that's what I would say is, uh, you know, show your pride in Newcastle, but also show your pride in the next small town that's being, uh, being highlighted here down the road the next few months. That was perfect. I could not have said that better myself. Thank you so much again for sharing your story. Thanks for coming in tonight and volunteering on the phones. And I'm going to send it back to Margaret. Margaret, you over there? I am right. here. Thanks again. That was great, Michelle. Thanks again to all of our sponsors who support this program and to all of you who've called in and joined the Ball State PBS family tonight to support the programming you love. Uh, I have one last thank you to read on the air. Mary Lou Hayes, thank you. Longtime member called in to support this program. Thanks to the wonderful residents of Newcastle for sharing their stories and for volunteering their time. If you haven't made that call yet, that's right. There is still time. You can pick up the phone, call 800-252-9472 or go online to ballstatepbs.org. With your annual gift of $60 or a sustaining gift of $5 a month, we'll send you the now entering Newcastle DVD as a thank you. Or if you can give a little more with an annual gift of $108 or $9 a month, we'll send you two DVDs as a thank you gift. And there is lots of bonus material on the DVD not seen in the broadcast tonight. So make that call now. Margaret, did we have any other names to read? I know that we still have some people coming in, but I think we have people coming in, but special. I think we've got something even more spectacular so because we're so inspired tonight. And we have yes. these amazing volunteers. Instead of us closing out right, the show, because we could say thanks for watching, thanks, and all the thanks, goodbye, all call the us, all yes, the things which you heard should all night. Call. Listen, we you have know, some friends yeah. who are going to sing you out Come tonight. Come on up! Come on up again. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you for supporting your local PBS station, Ball State PBS. Here you go in the center. Come on up! Come on up! Right in the center. You can hold it in the middle. Right there. There you go. Thanks for joining us tonight. 
All right, go ahead. Up above my head. Up above my head. I hear music in the air. I hear music in the air. Up above my head. Up above my head. I hear music in the air. I hear music in the air. Well, I really do believe, really do believe there's a heaven somewhere. Singing in the air, I hear singing in the air. Up above my head, up above my head. I hear singing in the air, I hear singing in the air. Well, I really, really do believe, really do believe there's a heaven somewhere, heaven somewhere.